Hey everybody, this is Mr. Bortnick, uh, continuing on in our AP Calculus AB notes on uh, Unit 1, Limits and Continuity. Today we're talking about Topic 1.5, Determining Limits Using Algebraic Properties of Limits. Again, we're going to title our notes Topic 1.5, Determining Limits Using Algebraic Properties of Limits. Enjoy today's notes. All right, so today we're going to jump right into that section 1.5 material. Uh, we're focusing our, the beginning of our notes today on just some general properties of limits. And so uh, we're going to title our page uh, and we're going to go over some of these general properties. Um, there are a couple theorems that really set the ground rules for what we can do with limits. And we're going to uh, see what those rules are first. And then we're going to go into some practicing with those properties of limits using some piecewise functions. And so that's going to be uh, the format for today's notes. Um, theorem 1.1 1 .1, uh, says that for some basic limits, so let B and C be real numbers and let N be a positive integer. Number one says the limit as x approaches c of b is equal to b. So if b is our number or b is our function, and there, notice that there's no x value at all, the output of that limit is simply the, the number, the constant. Um, it's sort of like thinking about uh, like a constant function. If I said that like y equals 4, no matter what value uh, I pick, the output would always be 4. Similarly, uh, if I have just an x for my uh, function, well, that x is approaching c, so the, x, the limit as x approaches c of x is going to simply become c. That's our second one. Our third one, this is uh, showing the same rule as number two, except it's saying, hey, it even works when you've got exponents. And so I have the limit as x approaches c of x raised to the n power, and they're saying that that's equal to c to the n. Essentially, all we're doing in this case is plugging in that c for the x in our function. So this x to the n is our function, and then the c is going in for the x. In theorem 1.2, we've got properties of limits. Uh, this is saying that uh, let b and c be real numbers, let n be a positive integer, and let f and g be functions with the limits. We have two limit statements. The limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l, and the limit as x approaches c of g of x is equal to k. So I have these two limits as x approaches c. I would just notice and sort of emphasize that uh, they're both limits as x approaches c, and we have two different equations that we're talking about, two different functions, f of x and g of x. And those limits have two different outputs. So one of them has an output of l, and the other one has an output of k. What this uh, theorem 1.2 does essentially allows us to do proper, like uh, allows us to do some basic operations with these limits. Um, and so we'll notice the first one, scalar multiple. It's saying if we've got this b out in front, so this constant or scalar, that when we take the limit as x approaches c, uh, that the b is going to stay outside of the function and we're going to essentially do the limit of the rest of it. You'll notice that, uh, let's change colors here. You'll notice that we've still got this limit as x approaches c and this f of x, and that's the same thing as what we've got up here. And so that's where the l came from uh, for, that, for that rule. Our second one that we've got here is the sum or difference. This allows us to add or subtract two limits together. So if I've got the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus or minus g of x, well, that's going to be whatever these limits are, my l, l and my k. So it's going to be l plus k if we're adding or l minus k if we're subtracting. Product rule allows us to multiply limits together. If I've got the limit of as x approaches c of f of x times g of x, well, it's going to be the limit as x approaches c of f of x times the limit as x approaches c of g of x, or whatever l times k is, if we're going up here and taking a look at, at those values. Quotient rule means division. So I'm dividing two functions. The limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x is going to be equal to the uh, their limits being divided. So the L divided by the K. Um, this is true. Notice only when K is not equal to zero, because if K was equal to zero, we'd be dividing by zero and we'd be sort of undefined. So K cannot equal zero in that case. Power rule uh, is a rule limit as X approaches C of F of X raised to the N. This is essentially saying that we can deal with the function on the inside and the exponent is going to stay on the outside. So the limit as x approaches c of f of x, that's going to go to my l, and then the n is just going to stay where it is up there. 
So that is our theorem 1.2. If we move on to theorem 1.3, limits of polynomial and rational functions. If P is a polynomial function, so polynomial functions are, are basic functions, sort of like if you think about like your cubic, like a 3x squared minus 2x uh, plus 7. That would be a basic polynomial function. Or we might have like 4x to the fifth minus 7x cubed plus 27. That's a different polynomial function. Um, these, uh, this is saying that if P is a polynomial function and C is a real number, then the limit as X approaches C of P of X. So P of X is again, is our polynomial function that we just get to get to plug in C for that X value. And so we get P of C for that, for that limit. If R is a rational function given by R of X is equal to P of X divided by Q of X and C is a real number such that Q of C is equal, uh, is not equal to zero. Uh, then the limit as x approaches c of r of x is equal to r of c. So we're putting in the c for the x. We notice that becomes r of c. And uh, that's going to be equal to p of c divided by q of c. And again, we plugged c in for both of these x's to get that. Theorem 1.4, the limit of a function involving a radical. Let n be a positive integer. The limit below is valid for all c when n is odd and is valid for c is greater than zero when n is even. So we're talking about specifically radical functions. Well, uh, this is saying that, hey, even if we're dealing with square roots or radicals, this rule still applies. We have the limit as x approaches c, the c goes in for the x, we get this. And so, uh, nice, we're really just running through all of the operations, uh, and these, is, these are gonna allow us to do limit problems uh, using those operations. Hey, composite functions, we did a lot of that last year. If f and g are functions such that the limit as x approaches c of g of x is equal to l, and the limit as x approaches l of f of x is equal to f of l, then the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x, hey, there's our composite function, is equal to f of the limit of x, as x approaches c of g of x. So notice the limit as x approaches c of g of x is this piece, and so essentially we're substituting that in, and that's how it becomes the l here. So it ends up equaling f of l. Last one, uh, theorem 1.6, before we get into our uh, written, our uh, practice problems, uh, is essentially saying, hey, all of this limit stuff works with trig functions. It works with sine, it works with cosine, it works with tangent and cotangent and secant and cosecant. Nothing special if we've got trigonometric functions. All of the operations work as you would expect for these functions. Okay, let's move on to our practice problems. So we've got our worksheet. Uh, hopefully uh, you've downloaded that from our class assignment for today. Um, all right, so let's start at the beginning. Well, if we've got x plus x way back when in algebra, we know that that is going to be equal to 2x. You've got two of those x's. Similarly, if I have the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus f of x, well, I've got two of those f of x's. So one thing I can do is pull that two outside of my limit statement. This is gonna be equal to two times the limit as x approaches c of f of x. And so this idea of grouping, which we did with the algebraic one, is the same idea that we're doing with limits, uh, but because this is a scalar, we're able to pull the two out outside of the limit statement. Um, I'd actually say, even before this, this is also equivalent to the limit as x approaches c of 2 f of x. But what we did here is essentially pulled that 2 out to the front uh, to get this value. All right, so example one, limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x is equal to 2. So that's given. Limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is equal to 4. That is a given. And the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x is equal to 6. That is a given. Table above gives selected limits of the values of f and g. What is the limit as x approaches 1 of f of negative x plus g of x over 2? Now, thinking about those properties that we had, uh, that we had earlier, what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to consider this like uh, two limits that are being added together. And I'm going to actually rewrite this out so you can see what my thought process is. And so I would say that this is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches 1 of f of negative x plus the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x over 2. And so all I've done is I've essentially split that limit up into two separate limit statements, which is now going to allow me to use these values that I've got up here that they gave me. 
we notice this first, this first piece, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of negative x. If we plug in 1 for our x value here, we would have f of negative 1. So I am going to look, uh, I'm going to look actually here to take a look and see what happens when we've got a negative 1, uh, even though our limit given to us was a positive 1, and that's going to be equal to 2 for that first one. We got that from right here. Plus, if we take a look now at the right side of this, the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x over 2, well, we know the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x is 6, which we found over here on the right side. And we know we can see that that's going to then need to be divided by 2. So this is going to be plus 6 over 2. So this is 2 plus 6 divided by 2, which is 3. My final answer for this is 5. That is what the limit as x approaches 1 of f of negative x plus g of x over 2 would be. Um, we're able to do this using these properties of limits. Notice one strange thing about example 1 is like, they never gave us an actual function for this. We don't know what f of x and g of x are. We only know these three facts about it, and we're able to do some limit uh, work by knowing our properties of limits, which is sort of cool. Moving on to example two. The graph of the function f is shown on the right. What is the limit uh, as x approaches four of f of f of x? We notice that this is a uh, composition of functions. It's a composite function. We have a function inside of the other one, so I know that it's one is inside of the other. And so if we're thinking about uh, our rules that we had back here, we're talking about theorem 1.5, the limit of composite functions. And so we'll be applying that theorem 1.5 uh, in this particular problem. So first off, we see the limit as x approaches 4. We're going to work from the inside out. Generally, that's what we do when we're, we're dealing with composite functions. And I'm going to imagine plugging in 4 for that f of x. My question is, what then is the limit as x approaches 4 of just f of x, just that inside part? And if we go over here to our graph, uh, we see 4 is over here. And if I go up to where the function is, uh, there's no left or right given. So we are doing a double-sided limit from the left it's going to that point, from the right it's going to that point, and that appears to have a y value of one. So I know that that is equal to one. And then using that theorem 1.5, essentially what I'm gonna do is plug that one in uh, as the inside of that f function. So um, this limit, I'm gonna draw an arrow. This is essentially side work, which we've got over here, uh, is gonna be equal to just f of 1. That f of x, or the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x, became the 1, uh, and we substitute that in, and so now we need to just look at our graph. Notice that this doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have a limit statement, so f of 1 is simply asking us what is the height of the actual function when x equals 1. Well, here's x equals 1. My function appears to be right here, which has a height of negative 1, and so that would be my final answer for example 2. Example three, hey, they appear to be giving us some facts again. So f of five is equal to one, g of five is equal to two, h of five is equal to three, and some limits. Limit as x approaches five of f of x is six. Limit as x approaches five of g of x is equal to negative one. Limit as x approaches five of h of x is equal to five. The table above gives selected values and limits of the functions f and g and h. And they're asking this limit and I see that inside this limit, if I'm, if I'm looking at this uh, particular equation, that I've got, got some uh, functions going on. I've got some operations going on. I notice specifically I'm seeing here, uh, I'm seeing some multiplication happening, I'm seeing addition happening, and I'm seeing some subtraction happening. So we're thinking essentially back to uh, our rules from theorem 1.2 which allows us to do uh, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction uh, using these rules. And generally with limits uh, like this, it's going to operate almost exactly the way that you would expect. I don't really think this is a particularly surprising thing. Um, but the limit as x approaches 5 of just h of x, well, we can take a look at our table. We see h of x uh, is going to be this. So limit as x approaches 5 of h of x is 5. So this first part is 5. And then we notice that this f of x 
plus two g of x is in parentheses, so what I'm about to put here is also in parentheses. The limit as x approaches five of just f of x is six, and we've got plus two of the limits as x approaches five of g of x, which we have is negative one. And then we're gonna subtract, like we've got here, just h of five. Actually, no, this, uh, is this part of the limit statement? No, it's just, it's outside of the limit statement. So this is where our limit stops. And now we're just subtracting h of five. So that appears to be three, if we take a look right here. So at this point, it's just algebra. It's just uh, dealing with, with our numbers. Um, this looks like we're gonna have five times, uh, what's that, four minus three. So my answer here should be 17 for example three. Last one, example four, we're talking about piecewise functions here. Uh, specifically, this is, uh, I wanna remind you, I guess, first off, like how a piecewise function works when we're, when we're looking at something like this. Remember, uh, this is saying that f of x is equal to two different rules. So the square root of 11 minus x, but only when x is less than negative five. And then it's saying, okay, we've got a second rule, x plus three divided by five minus x squared, but that's only when x is greater than or equal to negative five. So essentially what this is giving us is our, uh, our rules. And what this is giving us over here is our domain that those rules work on. Um, the thing about a piecewise function is that sometimes those parts of the piecewise function meet up and they make uh, a nice continuous function, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they look uh, like this, where over here, where we've got some parts like up here and some parts down here, and they're disjointed. They don't connect. Um, we won't really know until we graph it or, or test some actual values, but let's take a look. So for part A, the limit as x approaches negative five, we see this little exponent, so this negative, it's, we're coming from the negative direction, aka from the left side uh, of f of x. Well, we notice that negative five is sort of the separator of these two equations in our domain. And so since this is coming from the left, we wanna make sure that we're using the, the values that are less than that negative five. And so in this case for, for part A, I'm gonna use my first equation and I'm gonna just simply plug in the actual values for this. And so that is gonna be equal to the square root of 11 minus, plugging in that negative five. So I've got minus minus five, which comes a plus five. So 11 plus five is 16 and that square root is gonna be equal to four. That is what that limit would be equal to for A. For B, we've got uh, the limit as x approaches negative five looks like here from the right, from the positive side of f of x. That means we need to use the equation that is, has values that are greater than negative five. And so I'm gonna simply plug into that second equation or second rule that they gave us. So I have uh, what looks like negative five plus three divided by five minus negative five quantity squared. So this looks like this is gonna become negative two divided by five minus 25, so that's a negative 20, and that gives me a positive one over 10 uh, if those negatives cancel each other out. So that limit would be equal to one over 10, and that is B. For C, well, We've all already sort of done the work for this. For C, we notice here uh, that it's asking for an overall limit. There's no exponent on this. We're not talking about the left from the left or from the right. We have to take both of those into account. And we already did the left and the right. We saw that one of these limits from the left was four and the limit from the right was one over 10. We know that since those limits are not equal to each other, that this limit does not exist. So that is gonna be our value for C for that. I'm going to take a moment here and then scoot over to our second problem. Let me clear this up just so we can see. If you need to back up in the video to go see those again, feel free to do that. Uh, but we're going to need to move on. All right, so limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x. Notice this piecewise function has three rules. Ooh, interesting. So I see my rules over here and my domain over here. This first rule that we have here only works when x is less than negative one. The second rule that we have here works when x is between negative one and e, the number e. And the third one is uh, ln of x cubed when x is greater than e. 
So three parts to my domain. I'm gonna to need to pay attention in these limit problems to see which of these rules I need to use. Uh, let's, let's take a look at it. Well, so for this, the limit as x approaches negative one of g of x is what? We notice here this limit statement doesn't have an exponent, so we're doing a double-sided limit. We need to take into account both the left and the right sides. Uh, in this case, what would that work look like? Well, uh, I have the values here that are less than negative one and the values in the second equation for that are greater than negative one. So those are my two equations I'm gonna need to consider for the left and the right. Here's the work for the left. So in this case, we would have the square root of 10 minus that negative one uh, quantity squared. So that's gonna end up being 10 minus one, which is the square root of nine, which is three. If we take a look at the right, those are those values that are bigger than negative one. That's gonna be this 26 minus five times negative one quantity squared all over seven. And so it looks like we've got 21 over seven, which is also three. Notice here that both of those values are equal. That limit from the left and the limit from the right are the same. So that means that the overall limit here is gonna be equal to three for part A. For part B, if we uh, wanna find the limit as x approaches E from the right side, that means we need to use values that are bigger than E, which means I'm gonna use this uh, third equation right here. And so in this case, uh, we're gonna put in, let's use a different color to highlight. Um, so for this one for B, this is going to be uh, the natural log of E to the third power. Now, fun fact, natural log and E are inverses of each other. These are inverses and they cancel each other out. So this is actually just gonna be equal to three. That's our B value. So a natural log and an E that are next to each other cancel each other out. That's a nice fact about exponential functions. Um, I'm gonna follow up with Mr. Insulaco just to see whether you talked about those last year or not. We might do a little bit more about that when we certainly will going forward. Um, for C, last one, um, I'm gonna wanna know what the, so I already did the limit from the right here. This is the limit as X approaches E from the right. If I'm gonna find the overall limit for C, um, I'm gonna to need to do the left as well, and I haven't done that yet. So I have 26 minus five, um, sorry, this is my left. 26 minus five, I'm gonna plug that E in for X, so E squared all over seven. The question is, uh, whatever this is equal to, this is n a, not a nice number, um, it doesn't look like it's gonna equal three, whatever this whole expression is. So I know that since those things are not equal, I'm not gonna even bother finding it. I know that this uh, limit is gonna not exist. It does not exist because the left and the right are not equal to each other. All right, that is our notes for today. Uh, you've got some practice problems for, our, for section 1.5. Please reach out if you've got any questions or type them into the EdPuzzle, um, to the EdPuzzle, uh, or bring them to class or office hours. Good luck on your questions and good luck on your mastery check. Have a great day.